What's going on guys? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Amigos Code and in this video I'm going to teach you about Python. In this full course I'm going to make sure that at the end you are so comfortable with this popular programming language. If you're new to my channel go ahead and subscribe and also give me a thumbs up so I can keep on recording these courses for you. So in this course, I'm going to take you through the beginning level of Python and make sure that you understand key concepts. So Python is very popular and you can do a lot of good things with it. Whether you are interested in machine learning, data science, AI, building websites, building backend services and a bunch more. So I hope you are excited. And without further ado, let's go ahead and learn about this awesome programming language. Assalamu alaikum. Right, before we kick off this course, I want to make sure that you are part of the Amigos Code community. I'm going to leave the link in the description of this video so you can join the private Facebook group as well as Discord. And that way, if you are faced with any issues or, li or, or literally any question that you might have, you can ask them on the group and the group will help you. So the group is almost 10,000 members right now and it's growing and you should be part of it. Also, make sure that you practice as I teach, right? So when I teach, make sure you practice. If you wanna take this course on your own pace, go ahead and enroll for free on my website where you can skip the videos one by one. Without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off this course. The first thing that we need to do in order to use Python is to install it in our machine. So navigate to python.org and in this page right here, you can see that we've got the downloads link. So go ahead and click on downloads. And right here, because I'm on a Mac, I can see the download link for Mac OS. But if you are on Windows, simply click on Windows or Linux, you can simply use the, the version specific for your operating system, which is cool. Also right here, you can see that these are the active releases. So the active release right now, so the latest one is 3.8 right here. And if I show you, so 2.7 has reached end of life. So you shouldn't really be using this version right here. And if I scroll down, you can see that we can have, um, you know, specific release versions, right? But usually just go ahead and download the latest version, which has support until 2024. So right here, you can see that the latest version as I speak is 3.8.5. You might watch this video later. And if you have a, if there is a new version, everything that I'm going to teach you in this course will work with the version that you will install. So let me go ahead and simply download Python. There we go. That's finished. Now let me open up the downloads folder. And in here you can see that I've got Python. So let me simply click on it. And let me just collapse this. So the installation process for both Windows and Mac OS is really straightforward. You just simply have to press continue and then agree and then install. So before I actually press uh, or actually put my password, if you are on Windows, make sure to tick the box that says add Python to the path, right? So that's really important so that you can use Python from your terminal. So on the Mac, it does it for me. So right here, let me put my password, install, just give you a second. And there we go. So we've successfully installed Python. Next, let's go ahead and install a program that will allow us to write Python code. Right, for this course, we're going to download and install PyCharm, which is an IDE, i.e. integrated development environment. 
And what it does, it allows you to write Python code. So it gives you all the tools necessary for you to write code in Python. I've got a full course teaching you this amazing IDE. So if there is things that you are not sure or you think that there are so many things going on, don't you worry because I've got you covered. I've got a full course just on PyCharm and I wanna make sure that at the end of this course, or well actually at the end of both these courses, right? So um, uh, learning Python and then PyCharm, you have the tools ready there for you so you can start exploring other areas. Without further ado, let's go ahead and download and install PyCharm. When it comes to Python, there are two text editors which are the most popular one. So you've got VS Code, which is amazing, but there is a product from JetBrains called PyCharm, and this is by far the best IDE for Python developers. So go ahead and install PyCharm because it's amazing, and I always recommend JetBrains product because the integration that they give you, it's amazing, right? So what PyCharm really does for you, it's like a text editor, but with a bunch of features that allows you to be more productive. So with VS Code, you actually need to install a bunch of plugins to get the best out of it. But with PyCharm, everything is out of the box. So let's go ahead and download PyCharm. And in here, you can see the version for, let me just zoom this so you can see a version for both, or oh, actually um, Mac, Linux, and Windows. So go ahead and download the one for your operating system. And also you can see that there are two versions. So you've got a professional, which comes with extra features for web development, including HTML, JavaScript, and SQL support. But for most of the time, the community edition is more than enough. So go ahead and download the community edition, which is free and you don't have to pay anything. So I'm just going to allow, just give it a second. All right, so that's done. Let me open up the downloads folder. And right here you can see that we have the PyCharm community. So let's go ahead and double click on that. And then in here, the installation process, it's very simple. So simply drag and drop this into applications. And there we go. Now let me simply search for PyCharm. And then open it up. Open. Right here, simply say do not import settings. If this is the first time that you are installing PyCharm, and then right here, so if you've never used PyCharm, go ahead and stick with these key mappings. You can also choose the actual UI theme. So if you want light or dark, so I'm gonna go with dark. And what I'm gonna do is simply skip remaining and set defaults. And there we go. We successfully installed PyCharm. Next, let's go ahead and write our very first Python program. To create our very first program, let's go ahead and create a new project. And right here, you can give it a name as well as the actual location where the project is stored. So for my example, I'm going to simply name this as my, and then Python, and then app. And then you see right here where it says base interpreter you can see that we have Python 3.8. So this is the version that we've just downloaded. So if I click on this drop down, you can see all the different versions of Python that I have. But let's go ahead and stick with the latest one. And basically what an interpreter is, it's a program that executes your Python code. That's literally what it is. And then right here, you see that we have this checkbox, create a main dot py welcome script basically if it's ticked and tick it because i want to show you 
everything from scratch. Go ahead and untick the box if it is ticked and then simply create. And there you have it. So inside of this folder right here, so my Python app, go ahead and open it up. And inside, what we're going to do is create a new file. So right click, new, and then file. And right here, the name, the name of the file, simply call it as main and then dot. And then right here, make sure that you type py. So this is the file extension. So the same with, for example, JavaScript or Java or Golang. You have, for example, go for Golang, dot Java for Java, and then dot JS for JavaScript. With Python, it's the same. So dot py. So right here, let me simply press enter. And there we go. So what I'm going to do is press command and then one. And you can see the keyboard shortcut that I've used down below. So right here again, command and then one, and you can see the keyboard shortcut down here. So let's go ahead now and write our very first Python program. Go ahead and type print. And you can see that PyCharm is giving me auto completion there. So inside of this print block, go ahead and simply add double quotes. And right here, simply say hello and then Amigos code, and you can even add your name. So now let me simply press enter. So I've got a new line and to execute this program, simply right click. And then you can see, so right here, let me do it again. So right click in here and you can see that we have run and then main. So this main right here is the name of our file. So main.py, you don't see the actual extension, but it runs the main file. So let's go ahead and simply run. And right here, you can see that we have the low amigos code right here. If I was, for example, to change this to hello and then Mariam and then run, you can see that we have Mariam. So there you have it. This is your very first Python program. Right, let me first teach you a very important concept which you need to understand and that is variables. So to understand variables, just think about a box, right? So a variable is a box, right? And with this box right here, your variable, you have to give it a name, right? So let's say that we have this box right here and we name it X, for example. Now, inside of this box right here, the cool thing is that we can store values inside, right? So just to illustrate, so right here, I've got my pink phone. And by the way, don't laugh at me. But inside, I can store this phone right here inside. So now my variable X that we initially called X has the value of my phone, right? So my phone is inside of the variable, right? I can close the box and this is my variable now, right? Now, if you want to access my phone, I can access through the actual name X. Similarly, we can store. Um, so we're going to cover about objects, what, what this really means, but we can store, for example, so right here, um, I've got, uh, you can see, uh, it says keep calm and bismillah. But for example, I could take all of those letters, right? And put them inside of this box, right? And I'll close it. And let's say that I've, I've taken all of that and I put inside of this box, right? Um, you know, for example, this could be, for example, your name, right? Which is inside of this box, which is your variable, right? So this is a sequence of characters. You can also store numbers, right? If you wish, so primitives, i.e. Uh, one, two, three, or decimal numbers. For example, the number of pi, 3.14. Um, literally anything that you want, you can store within variables. So throughout this course, you're going to learn about, you know, different data types. So with variables, right? I've showed you that you can store a phone, you can store a sequence of characters. So those are the different data types, right? The different things that you can store inside of the variables. But 
In this course, we're going to create lots of variables and by the end of it, you should be really comfortable working with variables. But next, let's go ahead and create our very first variables. Right, let's learn how to create variables with Python. So a variable, it's a placeholder. It's a placeholder where you can store values. So here, let's have this variable right here called name. And in here, we're going to have this name called Jamila. So this variable, so the name of it, it's, um, uh, it's actually name, right? And then it holds the value Jamila. And this is a sequence of characters, right? So J, A, M, I, L, and then A. Now let's define another variable. So age equals two, and then let's say 20. So now we have two variables. So this variable age contains a number. So with variables, when you define variables, you can store literally anything that you want. Right. When I say anything, you can store numbers, you can store lists that you will learn later. But for example, I can have numbers and then here this is a list. So here I can store more than um, two numbers. Right. So you can see that this is a list of numbers. You can have sets, you can have custom objects, anything that you can think of in the real world. You can model in code and then store that in variables. Right. So variable. So variables are placeholders that allows you to store values. When working with variables, this is something that you have to be aware of. So here you see that we have age and I can say age equals two and then pretty much just a string, right? So age equals to sad. So here now what I've done is I've reused the same name but then I did put something else inside. And in this case is a sequence of characters. So you're going to learn about data types and how to avoid this. But for example, if I say this will be an integer, which is a whole number, you can see that now PyCharm is telling me that expected type ain't got str instead, which is a string data type. And you learn more about data types in a second. So let me just delete this because I don't want to confuse you. So just remember that if you have a variable like this, you can do it. If you want a decimal number. So here I'm going to say pi equals to 3.14. And this is a decimal value here, right? So you see that we have a whole number decimals, lists, this is a sequence of characters or strings. This is how they are known as strings. And yeah, so this is variables. Now, one little trick that you can do is the following. You see here where we have name and age, we can actually combine all of these into one single line. So I can say name and then age. Oops comma age. And then here I'm going to say comma and then 20. So this is the same as this, but in one line if you want it, right? So this first name is assigned to this value. So Jamila, and then the second variable name is assigned to 20. Finally, let's delete this variable right here age because we already defined it here just like that. And let's print all of these values. So print and then name, print age, print pi, and finally print numbers. To run this, I can right click, run main, or click the play button. And if you don't see the play button is because so right here, let me just go to edit configurations. And I'm going to delete this Python and then main and then apply. Okay. And you can see that it's no longer there, right? So what we need to do is simply right click and then run. And now the play button comes right here. 
So here you can see now the results from our variables. So Jamila 23.14, so that's pi, and then our list. And this is how to create variables in Python. So throughout this course, we're going to create lots of variables and you'll become really comfortable working with variables. When it comes to naming variables with Python, you've got a couple of choices. If you have a single world like name as we had before, so here let's say James. So this is the variable name. If we have full and then name, so this is two words, we can do the following. So if I type full name equals to and then J and then James, so you can see that this is the actual full name, right? You can use camel case, right? So this is the first word is all lowercase. And then the beginning of the second word, you start with a uppercase. So this is camel case. Or you can have it like this. So full underscore and then name. So all lowercase. So these are the conventions when it comes to Python. Now, obviously, try not to use, for example, names with, for example, ampersand, so this will not work, or names with dollar sign, um, or names with comma, for example, right, or dot in it, so they will not work, right? You can also have, for example, um, let's say age or uppercase, you can do it, right? So this is usually when you want to define a, a, a value that does never change, like a constant. Age is not constant because age uh, is a value that keeps on going up and up and up, right? So a constant would be something like the value of pi, right? So this this value does not change, so 3.14. But usually speaking, for single words, you'd start with lowercase, so never with, for example, name uh, like that. D don't do this, right? D don't do it. It's not the pattern. So always start with lowercase. If you have a second word, either use underscore or camel case, right? So camel case here would be, for example, like that. So there you have it. If you have any questions on naming variables, please do let me know. Otherwise, let's carry on. When you define a variable, you need to specify the value that goes inside of that variable. Now, that value has a data type. So let me go ahead and simply say brand equals to and then amigos and then code. And right here, age equals two and then two. And right here, numbers equals two. And for now, simply add the square brackets. And I'm gonna show you exactly um, what this means in a second. But for now, I just wanna show you the actual data types. So go ahead now and print and then type and then within parentheses and then pass brand. Let's also duplicate this. So I'm going to press Command D a couple of times. And right here, I'm going to pass H. And then right here, I'm going to pass numbers. So let me actually delete that space there. And in here, you see that we have three variables. And we want to find out their data type. So let's simply run it. And check this out. So in here, you can see that we have class and then str. So str simply stands for string. And then we have class and then int for integer. So this is the actual whole number that I've mentioned. And then in here for numbers, you can see that the data type is list. So let me actually give you another example. So in here, let's simply have the value of pi equals two three, oops, three, 0.14. And let's also print the actual type of pi. So let me duplicate that. And then in here, pi, just like that, run it. 
and in here you can see that the data type for pi is float. So float simply means that it's a decimal number, right? So anything that has a decimal number, so in here, three point, it's a decimal number, whereas age is a whole number, and a whole number simply means that it's an integer. So there you have it. Obviously, you do have uh, some other data types such as dictionaries, sets, and so on, but I'm gonna show you later in this course how to work with those. So one final data type that I wanna show you is, so right here, let's say is, and then adult, and then equals to true. So capital T, and then R-U-E, and let's now also bring the actual data type. So in here is adult, and then run it, and you can see that the data type for this is actually bool. So a bool or boolean represents true or false. So the, the only available boolean values that we have with Python is simply true or false, right? So oops, there we go. So this is false. When working with Python, you will hear people saying that Python is a dynamically typed language. And what that means, the data type of any variable or function is checked at runtime. So here you saw that we had the brand. So here, Amigos code, right? So this, so the data type for this is actually a string. Now, unlike languages such as Java, right, you would have, for example, the same is brand equals to an Amigos code. So here the difference is, is that with Java, and don't worry about this, this is Java, um, and, if you want to learn, and if you want to learn more about Java, I've got a full course on Java, just on Java, just like this one. But here, the key thing to know is that you have to specify the data type here, right? Whereas in Python, it is optional. You literally don't have to, right? The only thing that you need to do is say brand, just like that, and then you say, right, so now this is my content. Now, if you want to be explicit when defining your variables, i.e. saying that this is a string, you can do it, right? You can do it. So you can say column, so after the name of the variable, and then the data type, so str, and you've learned about data types. The same with booleans. So if I say is and then adult equals two, and then let's say false. So here, if you want to be clear about it, you can say dot and then bool. So this is a boolean, right? And this helps all the developers looking at your code, knowing that this is actually a string, the data type of this is a string. However, you won't see many people doing this with Python, right? Because Python, the reason why Python is, is, is simple and easy to learn is because it removes all of these keywords that other languages have, right? So for example, if you have a, um, a method, you just say def and you learn more about methods and then hello, and this is your method, right? So here I can say return and don't worry about this for now. You'll learn all of this. So return and then hello, right? So here you can see that the method is very straightforward. This method is really easy to learn. In Java, for example, you would need to do something like this. You'd need to say public and then string and then hello, the bracket, the, and then the curly brackets and then return and then hello, right? Just like that. And here, so you can see that this is much easier, literally it's much easier for beginners and to express whatever you want to do, right? So this is why Python is very attractive 
and has gained a lot of popularity for its simplicity. So in this function as well, and let me just comment this so you can have a reference. So in this function, if you want to say that this function uh, returns an, a string, you can say uh, here, you can say that this will return an str just like that. And it's a bit different with functions, but this is how you say that this function will return a string because here there's no way for me to know whether this returns a string or, or, or an integer because here I could say, for example, one, right? And you can see that, it, you know, there's nothing stopping me of doing that. However, if I now say here, for example, that this returns an int, right? You can see that this is actually complaining. So it's saying expected int got string instead. And now I just have to change this to uh, one, right? So this is the correct return type for this method right here. But usually you will see a lot of code without these uh, types because, um, you know, the less you write, the better. And, and when Python came out, it didn't have these concepts of actually specified of actually specifying the types. So this is something to bear in mind when you work with Python and know that Python is a dynamically typed language, which means that the data type is only checked at runtime and not compile time. So you can see the way that we can enforce the data type is by saying, right, so this variable has to be a string or a Boolean, for example. But in this course, we're not going to worry too much about this. So specifying the data type for each variable that we create, because it's not something that you'll see quite often. We can have comments that describes what the piece of code or functionality is all about. So to have a comment is very straightforward. Add the pound sign right here. And then here, I'm going to say, I am a comment. There we go. So this line right here won't be executed. So right here, this is just a comment. If I run the program, we should see hello and nothing else. So if I was to comment out this line right here, guess what's going to happen? So because this is a comment, if I run it, you can see that we have no output. So comments are used for documenting your code. So right here, let me simply go back. So we have two types of comments. We have single line comments, or we have multi line comments. So there are two ways that you can do multi line. So for example, here, if I want to have another comment, so a second, and then comment, or if you want to have a third comment, you can also have a third comment. And by the way, I'm, I'm simply pressing. So if I delete that, I'm simply pressing command and then forward slash. And you can see that I do get this pound sign right here. So in here, third and then comment. Right. So I can do this or I can remove all of this and press the following. So I'm going to press quote three times. So one, two, three, and then inside I can have my comments. So right here, I don't need the pound sign anymore. Oops, just like that. And now this is actually a multi line comment right here. So if I was to run this program, can see that we only have hello. And if I move, so in here, if I move print inside, you can see that this becomes part of the comment. And if I run it, you can see that we get nothing on the console. So this is all about comments. Let's learn about this awesome data type, which allows us to store sequence of characters. So you've seen that we can have, for example, brand equals two, and then within quotes. So right here, I can say amigos code. And now this variable right here, brand has this text. 
So this text right here is a string, so it's a sequence of characters. With strings, we can enclose them with double quotes or single quotes, just like this. Now, the cool thing about the strings is that they are very useful if you want to store literally any text, right? So imagine you, you have a program and you want to store some text that you can then perform some actions upon. So right here, let me go ahead and simply say print and then brand. And if I run the program, you can see that we have Amigos code right here. Now, what is interesting is that with any given string right here, I can say dot. And then right here, you can see that we have a bunch of methods right here, right? So in here, let's say that we want to uppercase every single um, character in this string right here. If I run this program, you can see that now everything is uppercase. So right here, have a look. This now is all uppercase. So these methods right here, they help us to work with strings. So right here, I can also say, for example, replace and then A. Well, actually, this has to be within quotes. So capital A with and then lowercase a, just like that. So if I run this, you can see that now I've only replaced the first A right there, right? So now it's lowercase. But let's say, for example, you want to replace with, let's say, 33, run it, and you can see that this now has been replaced. So this is strings in a nutshell. And let me also show you another method. So let's say that if, for example, you want to find out. So right here, let me actually comment this for you. So if you want to find out the actual uh, length, right? So how many characters that this string right here brand has, simply type, uh, let me actually show you a nice trick. So simply type brand and then dot and then len. So if I press enter, you can see that PyCharm is doing its trick. So basically we have to start with len and then surround with parentheses on both sides. And there you have it. So if I run this, you can see that there are 10 characters or 10 letters inside of this brand right here. Another thing that you can also do with uh, strings is you can compare them. So if I simply say print and then right here say brand and then equals and then in here, uh, I'm going to teach you more about this, what it, what it means later. But basically this is saying that I want to check whether the brand is equal to and then amigos and then code. And if I run this, you can see that we get false, right? It's not the case. But if I change this to uppercase and then run it, you can see that now it is true. So you also have not equal, so not and then equal, run it. You can see that it is false because they are equal. And if I change this, so this is now, see here you can see that they're not equal because this brand right here starts with uppercase A and this one starts with lowercase a. So if I run this, this is true, right? So they are not equal. Finally, let me show you one really nice thing, and that is if you want to find out whether this string right here, so the brand, so let's say that we want to find out whether the word code is in and then brand just like that, right? So we want to find out whether the word code is in the brand. So if I run this, you can see that it is true, right? So if I say uh, not and then in, so that's the reverse, run it, and you can see that it returns false because it is inside, right? And the, and the result of this is a boolean, right? So boolean can take only true or false, as you saw previously with data types. So there you have it. This is pretty much strings in a nutshell. Next, let me go ahead and show you some more examples 
on strings. Still on strings, let's create a variable called comment equals to and right here, let's say that we have, you know, some comments, right? So here and now let's say that we want to, for example, have a, another line. So you can see that I've just pressed enter and we have this backslash there. And if I press enter, you can see that I'm getting backslash. And basically, this is now my string, right? So if I pretty much just say print and then comment and then run this, you can see that we get this comment right here. But this is actually everything in one line and basically um, is not, it's not really what I want, right? So what I really want is to have things line by line, right? So if I collapse this, so what we can do is in cases where you need to have, you know, for example, long strings, you can simply get rid of all of this and then type double quotes and then double quotes and then double quotes. So now you can see that we have three on each side and then press enter. And now in between, you can write whatever you want. So here, so that's my comment, one more and basically you get the gist. So if I run this, you can see that now, check this out. So the output, so right here, let me show you. So this is exactly what I wanted, right? So this is really nice with Python and many other languages that are actually lacking this feature. Let me collapse this. And what I wanna show you is, let's actually say uh, something here. So let's say, hello. And then uh, this is like an email, right? So let's 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 simply say um, let's change this to an email. In fact, so email, and then email here, right? And then here, type these curly brackets, and then comma, and then how are you? And then maybe it was oops, it was nice and then talking to you, something like that, right? Now let's create a variable here. So let's simply say name equals to, and then Jamila. And now what we wanna do is actually pass the name, so this name and fill the gaps in here. So this is what this um, question mark allows us to do. So here I can simply now say email, and then dot, and then format, and then pass name. There we go. And if I run this, you can see that we have hello and then Jamila, right? So basically we've just filled in the gaps. And you can have as many of these as you want. And this is really nice when you wanna, when you have like a long string and then you wanna format the actual output. So another way that you can do this is with, so in here, so what I'm gonna do is simply remove the format, just like that, and simply type F at the beginning of your string, just like that. And you can see that now the IDE is telling us that we need to pass something in here. So now we can actually pass the name directly. And you can see that this is much neater. So if I run the program, you can see that we get the exact same result, right? And even here, you can also have, so let me actually say, for example, age, something like that, right? So, and then we can have the actual age in here so we can actually pass a value inside. And for example, if you want to compute something, let's say four plus four, you can even do it in there, right? So if I run this, you can see that we get eight in there. So there you have it. So I just wanted to cover these two things with strings because I feel like it's very useful and you'll end up using them a lot. If you have any questions on strings, please do let me know, otherwise let's move on.
All right, so we've had a great introduction about Python and you've seen variables and strings. And before we move further, what I wanna to talk to you is some of the rules that you need to be aware when working with Python. And the first one is indentation, just like that, add a common in there. So basically with Python, Python is very, very, different from languages such as Java, Golang, JavaScript, so on and so forth. So right here, let me actually go ahead and create a variable. So I'm gonna say name equals two, and I can put this a bit bigger. So name equals two, and then let's simply say Maria. And right here, if I want to have, for example, surname, right? So surname equals two, and then double quotes, and then Jamila. And basically, if I want to do this right here, this is not allowed. This is not, this is not allowed because with Python, things have to be indented. So here, there is no need for us to actually put this, um, how many spaces is this? One, two, three, four, right? So four spaces, and then start the actual uh, variable. So we can't really do this with Python. With JavaScript, we could definitely do it. But right here, you can see that we have an expected indent. So basically, this has to be like this in line. So when would you indent things? So let me actually give you a very good example. So here, let me go ahead and cut this. And for now, type def my and then function and you haven't learned about this, so don't worry. I'm just teaching you about indentation. So right here, have column, and now press enter. And now I can paste my two variables right here. And you can see that this now works. So this is the perfect time to indent things because this is a function right here and everything that falls under this function should be indented. So right here, if I want to put it in the same level as the def right here, you can see that this does not work. So literally, you have to indent things in Python. Right here, you can see that it's indented, and also you can see that my ID is complaining about this function name right here. So you can see that it says function name should be lowercase. So right here, what I'm gonna do is type my and then function, add an underscore there. So this is the actual convention right here. So another thing that I wanna talk to you about is, so right here, I wanna talk to you about is reserved and then keywords. So what reserved keywords are, are keywords that are specifically for the programming language. For example, def right here. So I'm not allowed to use def anywhere. So for example, if I want to say, um, you know, um, name equals to and then def, I can't do it because this is a reserved keyword. Or for example, and or is, these, oops, these are reserved keywords. So I can only use them to construct my code. So right here, what I'm gonna do is actually delete this. And at the very top, type import. And this is a reserved keyword. And let's simply import keyword. So what this gives us, so what this gives us, so this import and then keyword, we can simply now say print and then type keyword and then dot and then kw and then list. So in here, before I run this, you can see that we have these quickly brackets. So basically it says that we need to reformat the file. So right here, let's format the file and it simply adds the correct spacing in between. So if I put this smaller, so you can see that now things are formatted properly. Now let me go ahead and run this program. And you can see that this gives us a list 
and you can see that all of these are the reserve keywords. So it's sync, wait, break, class, continue. You've seen def, else, except for, from, import. So in here, import, lambda, not, so on and so forth. So these are the reserve keywords, which are specifically for using when writing your Python code. So you can only use them for constructing your code and nothing else. And finally, what I want to show you is with Python right here, you see that in languages, for example, such as Java or JavaScript, you need to end every single uh, statement with a semicolon, for example, here, right? So JavaScript is, is, is actually optional, but with Java, for example, you need to have a semicolon after every single statement. So right here, and also right here. But with Python, there is no such thing. So right here, we use no semicolons. Also, you can see that, for example, for this uh, function right here, instead of curly brackets in between, so many languages use it, so including JavaScript, Java, Go, C Sharp, this is how they define functions, right? And basically, this is not a valid syntax with Python because with Python, we use indentation right here. So we use indentation. And this is how we tell that this block of code, right? So name and surname belongs to this function right here. So it's enclosed within this function. So there we go. This is pretty much everything about the Python syntax, indentation, and reserve keywords. Let's learn about operators. So operators in Python are a construct that allows us to manipulate a value of an operand. So right here, let's consider the following example. So right here, type result equals two, and then right here, I'm gonna say one, and then plus, and then two. So in this example right here, and if I put it bigger, just like that, so one and two are the operands, and the plus sign is the operator. So we've got arithmetic operators, we've got logical operators, we've got comparison operators, and others. So in here, what we're gonna do is actually say print and then result and then run the program. And you can see that we have one plus two is three. So what I'm gonna do is actually inline this so you can see the keyboard shortcut down below. So control plus A and then N. So here, let me actually duplicate this and let me close that. So let's learn about the arithmetic operators. So here we have, if you want to multiply numbers together, you can add a star. So right here, so two times two, and you can also divide. So two divided by two, and we have the famous modular. So oops, it's not that one is this one right here, right? So let's say nine mod two, for example, right? So how many times two goes into nine? So two goes into nine four times, and then we have one number left, which is the result. So right here, let's simply run this, and you can see that we have three, four, right? So one plus two, three, two times two, four, and then 10 divided by five, or actually by two, my bad, is 5.0. And then right here, the modulus right here. So if I was to, for example, change nine mod three, so three goes into nine three times, and the remainder, right, that's what the mod or the modulus is, is the remainder, right? So there is no remainder. So if I run, you can see that it is zero. One more example, so 10, so three goes into 10 three times, right? And then we have one left. So run it, 
if I also change, for example, 7. So how many times 7 goes into 10? Just one time. How many remainder? 3. If I run it, you see that we have 3. And I almost forgot. So the last one that I want to teach you is the power. So right here, let me duplicate this. So you saw that multiplication, it's one star, but we also have two stars. So let me in fact put this right next to it, just there, and then press star and then star, right? So let me put simply two. So right here, what this is saying is two power two, right? So if I run this, you can see that 2 power 2 is 4. And if I change this to 2 power and then 5, right? So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So basically, um, let me just add a comment here. And then times 2. So basically, 5 times, right? So if I run this, you can see that we have 32. So there you have it. This is about Python arithmetic operators. Next lesson about the comparison operators. With Python, we have comparison operators. And what they allows us to do is to compare values and return true or false. So in here, let's go ahead and simply say print. And then what we're going to do is say 10. And I'm going to compare 10 with something, right? So let's simply say 10 and 5, for example, right? Now, in between, I can add these comparison operators. So this one right here is simply greater. So this is saying is 10 greater than 5? Is 10 bigger than 5, right? So if I run the program, you can see that yes, of course, 10 is bigger than 5. I can duplicate this. And I'm going to show you exactly all the comparison operators. So if I collapse that, so now we can say is 10 greater or equal. There we go. So is 10 greater or equal to 5? Of course it is, right? But if I change this to 10, for example, and then run it, you can see that this is true. But if I say is 10 greater than 10, of course, it's not, right? We get false there. So let me actually now put the equal back and let me show you the rest. So in here, we have the um, less sign, which is the reverse, right? So less. And we also have the not and then equal. And finally, we have the equal, right? So is 10 equal to 10? Of course it is. So if I run this, you can see that we get a bunch of booleans, right? It's true, right? So let's start from the top. So 10 is greater than 5. True. 10 is greater or equal to 10. Of course it is. Is 10 less? Or oh, actually, uh, I should have removed the equal there, right? So is 10 less than 10? That should give us false. So if I run it again, you can see that we have false in here. So this is the output. And then 10 uh, less or equal to 10, yes. Uh, and then 10 not equal to 10, you can see that it is false. And then in here, 10 equals to 10, of course, it is true. So there you have it. These are the comparison operators that you have within Python. Next, let me go ahead and teach you about logical operators. Now that you know how to work with comparison operators, let me teach you about logical operators in Python. So let me actually remove all of this here. And if I put this a little bit bigger, so you can see properly. So what the logical operators allows us to do is to combine multiple expressions. So in here, 
you saw that 10, right? So if I run this, 10 is greater than five, right? But I can also use the logical operators. So in here, I'm gonna add a second parenthesis. So a set of parentheses. And now I can also say, and, right? And let me just make this a tiny smaller. And then within parentheses again, I can say that, let's simply say one, right? Is greater than three, right? So this is the logical operator. So it pretty much allows us to combine one or more expressions. So if I run this, you can see that it is false. And this is because when you use the AND operator, every single expression has to evaluate to true, right? So this has to be true. This also has to be true, right? So now if I was to reverse this, right, and say that one is less than three, now we should get true. So everything will be true right here. So obviously I can combine, so I can even say and, so in here I can say and, and then let's simply use strings. So you can even combine strings here. So A and then equals two and then A, right? So let me put this on a new line, just like that, right? So you find in this, there you have it. So just like this. Right, so now if I run this, you can see that we get true, but now if I change A to, for example, C, so the whole thing is evaluated to false. So this is and, and I can even drop these parentheses if I wanted. So this simply allows me to group them together, right? So this is one expression, another expression, and then this is another expression. So the other logical expression that you have that is available to us is the or. So basically, oops. So basically, or means that at least one expression has to be true for the for everything to be true. So in here, I can say or instead of and, and then or in here as well. Right. So here now, check this out. If I run this this entire thing will be true. But now if, for example, I say that 10 is less than five and then one is greater, so is greater than three, which is not the case, or A is equal to lowercase c. So in, in this case, this is false, right? So this is false, this is false, and this is also false, which means that everything will be false. But now if I, for example, say that A is equal to A, now basically we only need one, one expression to be true for the entire thing. So right here, you can see that now we have true. The last logical expression that I'm gonna show you is the not. So not simply allows you, and actually uh, just before I move on, so here you can see that we have or, but basically you can combine all of these expressions, right? Or with and, and you can use them uh, throughout your code. So you don't have to specifically just use and, you can also use both. So the last one I wanna show you is the following. So let me simply say that in here, I have uh, A, so let's have A, or let's simply have um, James, and then equals to, and then Maria, right? So in here, if I print this, you can see that it's false, right? Because these two strings, they are not the same, right? And right here, what we're gonna do is actually say not. So here, I can surround everything with a not. And basically what not does, it reverses this expression right here. So now this will be true because I've said uh, Maria is not, uh, or actually James is not equal to Maria. So if I run this, you can see that it is true. So this is everything about the logical operators. And obviously you'll see exactly 
how everything will fit together in a second. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Right, the last operator that I want to teach you is the assignment operator. So you've seen this, but I didn't explain exactly um, what it meant. But the assignment operator allows us to assign values to variables. So you've seen that we had, for example, brand equals to and then amigos, oops, amigos code, right? So in here, this right here, so the equal is the assignment operator because we are assigning a new value. Oh, actually, we are assigning a value to this variable right here. Now, I could also go ahead and simply say brand equals to right here and then something else, right? Let's simply say Nike, for example. So now if I print brand, you will see that we get the latest value, which is assigned, right? So initially it was Amigos code, but then we change it to Nike. So let me teach you about another assignment operator, which is going to be useful to you. So number equals to zero. So I can say that number is plus and then equal to one. If I print the value, or actually if I print number, run this, you can see that we have one. So what this assignment operator is doing, it's simply taking the initial value, so number, and then adding one right? So plus equals is the same as so if I simply add a common here, so actually, let me just grab this pound sign. So if I add a common here, so this is the same as saying number equals to number. And then plus and then one is the exact same thing. Right? So in fact, if I remove this, just like that, and then run it, you can see that we get one right? If I change to 10, we get 10. If I change the original value to let's say 14, we should get 14 now, right? So instead, you use this assignment operator, which is much shorter in here. So just like that. In here, you can also say that instead of a plus, you can say minus, you can also say times, right? So four and then times. So you take the value and then you times it by three is 12. You can even divide as well. So division just like that. And then by two, right? So if I run this, we get 2.0. If you if you want to power the number, you simply say star star, and then equal and then two. If I run this, you can see that four power two is 16. I can change this to three. There we go 64. So these are some of the assignment operators that you will end up using most of the time. I'm going to leave some more links around these operators so, so that you can go and learn more about them. But this is pretty much everything you need to know about these operators. When you start writing applications with Python, you most likely will be performing lots of decision based on certain conditions. And this is when if statements come into play. So if statements, they are very easy to use. And basically it allows you to perform um, or actually execute a piece of code when a certain condition is met or not. So in here, let's say that we have a variable and then we're going to have this variable to be 15 right here, right? So this will be the variable 15. Now, what we want to do is actually print to the console whether the number is positive or negative. So to do that, we can use the if statement. So we're going to say if and then number 
is greater than zero and you've learned about comparison operators so this is why i was saying to you that everything will come into play now remember when we've learned about indentation right so now i can add a, a column and then enter so this now so this block right here everything that we type from this indentation right here belongs to this if statement right here print and we're going to say number and then pass number is and then positive just like that so let me just put this smaller just like this so you see everything right so now let me add um, a space there and let me save this right so now if i run this program you can see that we have number is positive right so number is positive so if i change this to let's say zero right you can see that we get nothing because we said if number is greater than zero right but the number is not greater than zero right it's actually zero so in that case we're going to skip everything within this uh, block right here right so what we can do is say right so if it's not equal well actually if it's not positive right so we want to say else so we're going to print and then let's actually print the exact same thing here and or actually in fact let's just have this so f and let me just remove this number here so it's shorter right so here i'm going to say number is and then negative just like that so if i now run the program oh i didn't want that for sure i wanted this so if i run it you can see that zero is negative well actually zero is not negative right so uh, and i'm, I'm going to show you exactly in a second but for example if we have um, minus one you can see that minus one is negative if we have two two is positive so you can see how if statements work now if we go and say that zero right so let's simply say zero right here we're getting zero is negative so let's actually use another keyword that we can use with if statements so in here i'm going to say that if the number is greater than zero we're going to print this and then in here i'm going to say l and then if right so this is another condition that we're going to check so if number equals to zero right i'm going to say print and then f and then the actual number is and then zero or oh, actually zero is zero but you get the idea right so now if i run the program you can see that zero is zero right and let's actually change the message here so we're going to say that it's simply zero right so let's just print the number right so there we go zero so this is pretty much everything about if statements so in here you've learned about comparison operators and in here you remember right so remember that this is a block right this is a block we can actually combine um, with logical operators so we can even say for example here i could say not right i could say not and now everything flips everything flips around right so if i run this you'll see uh, that right so basically if i say that now this is actually 10 and before remember that 10 was positive if i run it you can see that it says now 10 is negative and that's because we've just flipped the actual condition right and you can also have ands so on and so forth this is how you use if statements for making decisions Let me just emphasize something with if statements. So you saw that 
if you want to use if statements, it's not necessarily that you must have, for example, elif and then else. It's not necessary. It's not, because you saw that if I remove this and then run it, you can see that we have 10 is positive, right? And I can even say now here, so I can say print, so right after it, and then hello. I can even say that, and you can see that we have 10 is positive, and then 10 is positive, and then hello, right? Because, so in here, we've reached this branch, and then, right, this is true, we're going to print this, and then we're going to carry on our code, right? So this gets printed. So in here, you saw that the L if, right, allows you to perform extra conditions, extra checking, right? If the number is equal to zero, print number, right? And then you have the else. So the else is the last option if none of the above is met. And one thing to bear in mind is that you can have as many L ifs you want. So in here, oops, let me just grab this again, just like that, and then put it here. You can have as many of these, right? So oops, just like that, right? And just bear in mind that you can only have one if, and then you can have as many L ifs, and then you can only have one else, right? Which is the last thing if none of the above is met in here. So this is, so I just wanted to point this out because, you know, sometimes you might end up doing things like this where the first condition isn't met. Then you have this, the second one, the third one, and then you have the fifth one. And, you know, the last resource is else when none of the above is met, then you want to perform something else. This is all for if statements. Next, let me teach you ternary if statements, which are really awesome. Right, let me teach you about the ternary if statement. So you saw that we can have if number is greater than zero, we can say that the number, so we can say print, and then positive, and then if is not the case, we can have else, and then print um, zero or negative, right? So in here you see that we have four lines of code, right? Four lines of code for whether the number is positive, and if it's positive, we perform uh, uh, line four, otherwise we say zero or negative, right? So what the ternary if statement allows us to do, it's simply to have everything in one line. So let me actually show you. So in here, say message, just like that. And now I'm going to say equals to, and then check this out. I'm going to say positive, and then if, and then I'm going to have my condition here. So number, there we go. And then else, and then this. So zero or negative, just like that. And basically, if I make this smaller, you can see that we actually collapsed everything into one single line, which is really cool, right? So this is the power of ternary if statements. And to be fair, you should really be using them only, like only if you have one if and then else, right? As soon as you have L if, as you saw before, so L, so here L if, you should, you should, you should, you can do it with these ones, right? So basically you can have another uh, if in here, right? So you can have another condition, but it becomes just, you know, too much. You should really be using them for cases where you only have one if and then else, and that's it, right? So now I can say print and then message. If I run this, you can see that we have positive, and if I change this to, let's say, minus one, run it, 
zero or negative. This is how you use ternary if statements with Python. So you've seen that I showed you this example where I simply say type and then in here we've had this curly brackets right here or actually a square brackets right so if I run this code you can see that we have list right so this is actually a list so what a list is is the following right here what I want to do first is collapse this so we have this variable right here called number equals to one right let's have number two and then equals to two we can also have number and then three equals to three right and you get the gist right but so what we can do instead is to collapse all of these three variables into the following i'm going to say numbers so this is the name of the variable and now I'm going to have these square brackets and now I can go ahead and simply say one, two, three, and let's simply put four in there, right? And basically now I can get rid of everything. So now this is my list that contains all of those numbers. And if you want, you can even have um you know anything inside here right so for example if you want uh, a letter a inside or if you want another list right you can definitely have it right but it's a bit awkward to have a list with different data types inside right so for now just let's just keep it simple and have for example minus one and then in here let's have zero right so what i want to teach you with lists first is how they work so in here you see that we have one two three four five six elements so the way that you access an element within the list is as follows so if i say print and then numbers right so let's just run this you can see that we have our list right but let's say that I want to grab only this number here. So number one. So the way we do it is by placing the square brackets and then we pass an index. So this is the actual index, right? So index zero. So in many languages, including Python, when you work with lists, this first element is the index zero this number two is index one, this is index two, index three, index four, and index five. So now if I run it, you can see that we only have one, right? So if I do index five, you can see that it's zero. So, you know, I can even change this to uh, minus, well, actually minus, 20 for example run it you can see that it is minus 20 so this is something to bear in mind right and if we try to access so let's try to access index 6 and we know that this is index 5 and it's the last element right so this will actually throw an error so if i run it you can see that we have list index out of range and you can see the index error right here so something to bear in mind when you work with lists so as i said you can pretty much just have a list of anything right so here let's simply say that we want another list here and let's have for example um a and then b inside or oh, actually just be like that right so now this is index and then six or oh, actually six if I run this, you can see that now we have another list, A and B. And right here, we can even say now, right, give me the first index. And this will give us A, right? So if we want index one, that's B. 
and index two that that's not existing and we get an error again but you really wouldn't have um you know uh, a, a list with different data types right so for example you can see why you would have a list instead of lists for numbers maybe you want to you know build like um, a matrix for example and you can do it with lists within lists so there you have it this is the introduction on lists next let me show you some of some of the available methods that are available within lists right so let's learn about some of the useful methods within lists so in here let's take this numbers list right here and at the end simply say dot right so in here this gives you again a bunch of methods or functions that you can use on the actual underlying list so for example if you want to sort your list, you can simply say dot and then sort. So if I run this, we get none. And this is because this actually doesn't return a, a list, right? So what we need to do is simply say num, oh, actually um, print and then numbers here. So if I run this, now you can see that the list is actually sorted. So here, we started with minus 20. Well, actually, we ended up with minus 20 at the end. And now we start with minus 20, 1, 1, 2, and then 3, 4. So now it's sorted. If you want, for example, the reverse, and let me comment this out for you. So you can say numbers, dot, and then reverse. There we go. If I run it, you can see that now it's the actual reverse, right? So 21 and then 4, 3, 2, 1. So basically, we've just reversed the order of our list. If you want to append to the list, you can simply say numbers dot and then append. So here we're simply adding, let's say, 1000, right? So we're just adding a number to our list. There we, there we go. If you want to find out the number of elements inside of the list you can use len right so i can say print and then len and then numbers and if i run it there we go and you can see that we have seven items inside of the list we can also remove every single item inside of this list so if i comment this and if I say numbers dot and then clear and then run, you can see that now we don't have anything, right? So we've just cleared our list. And finally, what I want to teach you is if I run this again, so you see that we have the list. Let's say that we want to find out if, right? So we want to find out if um, any given number is within the the actual list so for that we can say numbers or actually we can say the number that we want so for example five and then in numbers if i run this we get false i can say five and then not in numbers and of course it is true right so if i oops if i say that we know that we have minus 20 there so minus 20, oops, no minus 10, minus 20, inside of numbers, run it, and you can see that we get true. So there you have it. These are some of the common methods that you have within lists. If you want to, for example, delete a number, right? So for you to delete a number, so let me actually comment this, oops just come in this and then print and then numbers right so if I run this so let's say that we want to delete this number right here right so number one so we can say so in here we can say numbers dot and then remove in here so we want to remove one and run it 
can see that one is now gone. So if we want to remove minus 20, oops, minus 20, you can see that minus 20 is gone, right? So if we have, so in here, if we have two ones, right? So two ones, and then if I say remove one in here, run it, you can see that it only removes the first instance, right? So it only removes the first instance that it finds. We can also remove with pop. So in here, I can say pop and there we go. So pop removes the last element. So in here you saw that we had 20, right? So this is the actual top of the stack. Um, and pop simply removes this one and then goes from the top. You can think of, of it being like this is this is the actual bottom of of the list, right? And this is the top. So pop starts from the top of the list and then it goes and then removes, right? So if I say pop two times, we should remove minus one as well. So if I run it, there we go. You see that we removed minus one. So I just wanted to show you um, how to delete because it's something that you will do quite often. Another way that you can delete is if you say, for example, so here, let me add a space, you can say, so del and then numbers, and then in here, we can simply pass the actual index. So run, you can see, oh, actually, we are popping uh, the other two numbers, right? But if I comment this for now, you can see that we had two ones. So here, two ones. And let me just remove this one here. So right here, if I run it, we should see two, right? So we've removed um, the first element. If you want to remove two instead, so two is at position or actually at index one, run it, you can see that two is now gone. You can also delete by a range. So let's say that you want to delete everything from everything starting from zero, so index zero, all the way to index three. You can do that. And right here, let me just show you. So we're going to remove zero, one, two, and three. And we're going to be only left with minus one and minus 20. So if we run this, there we go. So actually we have four. So yeah, basically it's actually going, um, so three is actually uh, exclusive, right? So it doesn't remove this one, right? So it just removes these three, actually. It's not index based, right? It's from zero all the way to three, and three is actually exclusive. So if you want to remove, let's say, all the way to six, run it, you can see that everything is gone. Let's try seven. And basically, it's not it's not giving us an error, um, as you saw with accessing the index seven, because it's not, it's, it's not there. But here we get an empty list. So there you have it. These are some of the ways that you can remove items from any given list. Now let me teach you about sets. So with lists, you saw that we had this variable right here, numbers, and inside we can literally just put anything that we want, right? You can put numbers, you can put strings, you can put lists within lists, so on and so forth, right? You can put the entire world inside if you wanted to. So sets is somewhat similar to a list, but the difference here is that with sets, duplicates are not allowed. So let me actually show this to you. So in here, I'm going to start, uh, just have a, a numbers and then list, I'm gonna call it list. And here, let's have, let's have a numbers and then set. So the difference here is that with sets, you have these curly brackets instead of um, square brackets. So here, if I have one and then one, so let's print and then number, 
list and then let's also do the actual uh, set oops just like that number set and then run this you can see that we have one one but inside of our set duplicates are not allowed duplicates are not allowed so something to bear in mind is if you don't want if is if you don't want duplicates use a set otherwise use a list and what sets gives us so sets they pretty much you know the, the methods that lists give us is you know set also give us so if you want to clear you can say for example uh, clear you have pop you can see the length there as well you can add you can remove so here remove and basically is the exact same thing as we've done with lists and also in here so you can see that we have numbers but this works the same with for example if you have um well actually let me not change that one right so for example here let's have a letter or oh, actually letters there we go set and then here if i have a and then a and then b and then c and let's have let's just have one more c we should just get a b c right and we should actually print and then letter set so if i run this you can see that we have uh, B A C actually, so and this is actually uh, this brings me to to the point that so in here right, so you saw that we have A A B C C right, and this was the actual order that we added them right. The difference between sets and lists is that with sets the order is not guaranteed. So here, if you were to expect, for example when you retrieve the elements, right? So the actual set, the same order, it's not gonna happen, right? So orders, so sets are unordered. So if I run again, perhaps we should see a different order. There we go. So now it's actually A, B, C. If I run again, you can see that we have B, C, A, right? So Keep in mind those two, so no duplicates and order is not allowed. And also the actual syntax is different, how you create the actual set and lists. So with sets is curly brackets and with lists is square brackets. Lists, you can have duplicates and the order is guaranteed. Let me teach you about set union set intersection and set difference so to illustrate this purpose let's have letter and then a or actually letters and then a equals two and in here let's have a and then b and then c and let's also have d right so d so let's now have a second set. So let's simply say letters and then B. Whoops, B. Now let's print union. So what union means, and in fact, this second uh, set, let's simply have A, B, C, D, and then E, and then F, right? So what set union means, it means that we can take letters A and we can say union and then letters, whoops, and then B. So if I run this, the output is basically the union, right? So it's just a, a, it's just everything combined, right? So A, F, E, D, B, uh, and C, right? So it's literally everything. And remember the order is not guaranteed right so that's the actual union so union just takes everything from both sets and then puts it 
inside of another set. So here, let's actually have union, so equals to, and then letters A, and then letters, and then B, right? And now I can print the actual union. Next, let's learn about the actual intersection. So intersection is is very interesting. So here I'm going to say inter and then section equals two and then letters A. And then to use intersection, you simply have this ampersand, this ampersand, and then letters and then B. Right. So this now is the actual intersection. So what I'm going to do actually, um, F and then format this. So I'm going to say union and then here that will be union just like that. Right. And let's have F there as well. And then enter and then section and let's have intersection and let's have an equal there and equal here. So, and I actually, this should be within quotes and there we go. So if I run this, so for the intersection, and this should also be quotes here, there we have it. So if I run this, you can see that the union is everything, but the intersection, we have an empty set, right? And this is because in here, so there is nothing that intersects between these two sets. So if I was to have, for example, a in here, and then run it, you can see that now we get a inside. So basically, it's whatever happens in both sets, or actually, whatever occurs in both set in both sets. So a is in letters A, and also in letters B. So if I was to have D in here, so D, just like that, run it, you can see that it happens in both sets. The final one is the actual difference. So let's go ahead and say print. And then well actually, let's create a variable first. So uh, difference equals two and then letters a and then the difference you simply use a minus so minus and then letters and then b right and the difference is so right here let me expand this so the difference is oh actually the difference so this sign right uh, means right so everything which is in in set um, so this set right here, so everything which is in letters A, but not in letters B, right? So here we have A, B in both sets, but C, D, right? They are oh, actually um, B and C, my bad. So B and C, they are not in letters B. So right here, if I say print and then difference, and let me actually have the exact same thing here, just like this. And if I run, you can see, there you go, we have C and B, right? So this is the actual difference. And here, it's very important, right? So if you flip this around, so B, so letters B, minus, and then letters A, this will be a different result. So if I run it, you can see that now it's F and E. So there you have it. This is how, oh, actually, <laughs> this should be difference here. So this is just a string, right? The friends. So there you have it. This is pretty much everything about the set union, intersection, and difference. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. Let's learn about this data structure called dictionaries with Python. So dictionaries allows us to store key value pairs. So in here, let me go ahead and say that this is a variable called person. 
equals two. And then the dictionary works as follows. So here, this is the actual opening curly brackets and then close um, curly brackets. And inside you have what it's known as keys, right? So here, let me simply say name. And then here you can specify the actual value, right? So let me actually move that space there. So here, this is Jamal, and I'm going to have a comma there, age, and then Jamal's age is 20, and I forgot all of them there. So this is a dictionary, and I mean then this here, and let's also say that this has an address just like that, and then here, US, right, uh, USA, there you go. So this is our dictionary and in here. So this is the actual key and this is the value. So key value. It's a key value pair data structure. Now, if I want to get values or oh, actually uh, print and let me put this smaller so you can see a little bit better. So in here, I'm going to say person. And then if I want to get, for example, name, right? So this is how I do it. If I run it, you can see that I do get Jamal, right? But if the key, so this is the actual key and I'm getting the actual value. So if the, if the key doesn't exist, you can see that we get an error saying that key error and then name. So that key is not present. So if I want age, for example, simply type age, run it 20. And finally address and then run it. You see that we have USA. So maps are really helpful when you have, for example, structured da structured data like this, where you need to have a key and then a value. Now with keys, right with keys, they have to be unique right? You can't do this, for example, um, name and then name, right? You you can't, right? So you can see that even uh, PyCharm is telling me dictionary contains duplicate keys name. So the keys, they must be unique. So let me just put that back. And let me actually now show you some methods, right? So with dictionaries, I can say, well, actually, let me just put everything there. So we want the actual name, we want age as well, right? So with dictionaries, we can say print, and then let's say person dot. And in here, the same methods that you saw with lists and sets, they are available. But here, for example, you can see that we can get the keys. So if I run this, so here, look at the keys right? So these are the keys, name, age, and address. We can also get all the values. So I've just pressed command D and then values. And now we get the actual values. So in here, you can see that we have Jamal 20 USA and the keys above. If you want to clear, so right here, so if you wanted to clear, for example, person dot and then clear. And basically now if I print, and then person right here, you can see that it's empty, right? We've just cleared everything. So let's actually not do that. And one thing that you might want to do is actually update the value, right? So let's say that we want to update the actual age. So before I print person and then dot, and you can also say get, right? And we want to get age. So there, and basically this actually is another way of getting. So let me see in print so you can see. So you can do it this way right here. Oops, this way or this way. So I kind of prefer this way here because it's the, the syntax is better. So if I run it, you can see that we have 20 in here, right? So what I wanted to show you actually was, so if I want to update age, right? So I can simply say, 
that, right? So I can say that. Oops. Oh my God. Uh, can't type today. So in here, I'm going to remove that print statement there. And I'm going to say equals to 100. Hooray. Now, if I run this, check this out. So in here, age was 20. And then we updated age to 100. So there you have it. This is how to work with dictionaries. So dictionaries is very powerful and you will end up using them quite a lot. This is all for now. If you have any questions, please drop me a message. But this is the most common data structures that you're going to be using with Python. And I'm going to drop some links on some other data structures, which you will find them useful as well. Catch me on the next one. Now is the perfect time to learn the concept of loops. So loops in Python allows us to iterate through sets, lists, or pretty much um, dictionaries or, or any data structure available. So let's create this list right here. So list, well, actually, let's simply say names equals to Ahmed and then Anna and James. And let's also have uh, Jamila, for example. Right. So this is our list. Let me put this on a new line. Right. So this is our list of four names. So you saw that if, for example, I want to grab print and then names, oops, names, and then names, zero. And if I do one, two, and then three. So right here, you can see that I do have the name. So Ahmed, Anna, James, and Jamila, right? But this is me going out and actually printing line by line. So what loops allows us to do is to actually loop through the list and then have access to each individual item. So the first way of using loops is using the for. And then here I'm going to say name in and then names and then add the column right there. Very important. And also the indentation is very important, right? So right here, add, uh, just press tab and then you get that indentation. Now here, print and then the actual name. If I run this, you can see that we do get the exact same output, but now we are actually looping through our list right here. So this is loops in action. So there you have it. This is how you loop through your lists using for loop. So this construct right here. So this is actually called for loop. So here, let me add a comment. So for and then loop. And right here, you see that we have um, a list, but this could also be a set, right? This will also work and then run it. And there we go. You can see that we get the exact same output. So next, let me show you how to loop through dictionaries. Right. So you saw that we had this dictionary called person and it has the key name value Jamal age 20 address USA. So in order for us to loop through this dictionary, we can use the following construct. So it's the exact same way that we've done with lists, but we get an additional information. So here for and then key and then in and then person and then print and then the actual key. So if I run it, you can see that we are getting the actual key. So name, age, and address. 
Now, what we can do is the following. So here, I'm going to say F, and then double quotes. And here, I'm going to pass the actual key. And then I'm going to say key, and then column, and then value, column, oops, column, and then inside, I'm going to say person, and then get the actual key. So here, I'm just passing the key inside, right? Now, if I run this, you can see that we have key name, value Jamal, key age, value 20, and then key address, value USA. So this is one way of, of looping, or we can do something better. So here, what we're going to do is actually comment this. Oops, I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to comment this. And what we're going to do is the following. Let's simply say four, and then key. And let's also get the value in and then person dot and then values. And then don't forget the actual column and make sure you indent with tab. Now, let me actually take this print statement and put it there and comment. And I need to indent this and right here, remove that. And this actually is the value, right? value. And there we go. So if I run it, and we get an error, so too many values, and actually, this is meant to be items, right? So my bad. So items in there. So for key value in person, the items, and then run it. And you can see that we get the exact same result. So let me actually show you what items contains. So values, and you've seen this, right? So print, and then person dot and then items. So if I run it, you see that this is the actual items, right? So this is an array of key value pairs, right? And then we are simply looping through it, and then getting the key and the value instead of doing it this way, where we actually um, had access to the key only. And then we said person in here, so person, and then we pass the key, which is how you access the value for any given key. So this is pretty much how to loop through dictionaries. If you have any questions, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. All right, I thought it would be nice for you to have a go at this exercise. So given a list of numbers, right? So let's say that we have some numbers here, just like this. And you can put any numbers that you want, right? So given a list of numbers, try and sum up all the numbers inside of this list right here, right? So you need a variable to store the result. And then you need to loop and then perform the actual addition, right? So give that a go. And I'm going to give you the solution in the next video. All right, let me give you the solution for this exercise. So what we need first is to have a variable. And we're going to call this variable as result in here equals two and initially will be zero. Now we need to loop through this list right here. So numbers four, and then number in and then numbers column and then on the new line, say result. And then plus equal right? And then number. So number, right? So remember that this assignment operator is the same as saying number, or oh, actually a result plus and then number. 
is the exact same thing, right? So what I'm doing is simply collapsing it into plus and then equal and then number. And finally, print the actual result. So I'm going to say F and then result equals two and then result. So let's run this. And you can see that result is 31. So this was an exercise on looping just to make sure that you understand how it works and do a bit of logic so that you can practice your Python skills. If you have any questions for this exercise, please do let me know. Otherwise, let's carry on. Right, let me teach you about the while loop. So while loop works a little bit different than the for loop. And basically it loops while a condition is true. So let's start with this example right here. Let's say that we have the actual number and then equals to zero right here. So we're going to say while and then here, so the same with if statement, we have to pass a condition. So here we're going to say while the number is less than 10, right? And then add the column, we're going to do something. So for now, let's print. So this is what we want to do. So we want to print the actual number. So if I run this, you should see that we have zero, 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 you know, it's just basically, it's just printing zero, right? Because the number zero is less than 10 in here. Therefore, we're going to keep on printing the number. So what we're going to do here is the following. So we're going to say number and then plus equal and then one. So each time that we go through the loop, we're going to increment the actual number. So if I run this, you can see that now we get zero through nine, right? As soon as the, um, the number is bigger than 10, we skip out of the loop. And this is the power of the loop. So we can also here have else. So this is another construct with, with while loop and then print and oops, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. And here else in while and then loop. And then if I run it, you can see that. So basically this is the actual end, right? So when it reaches the end, so when this condition is no longer true, we have the else block, which then we can say anything. And in fact, let's just say that um, while loop ended, just like that. And if I run it, you can see that we have while loop ended. And basically the while loop is very simple um, and, and yet very powerful. And basically just allows us to keep on looping while a condition is true. As soon as it's false, we skip out of the loop. We, uh, if you have the else, we, we execute the else and then it just breaks out of the loop. So there you have it. This is all about while loops. Let me teach you about two keywords that you're going to be using with both for loops and while loops, and they are the break and continue keyword. So what I'm going to do here is remove this elf statement there. And right here, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to say that if and then number, so still inside, if the number is less, or well actually if the number is equal to five, we want to do something, right? So for now, let's simply say print and then number is and then five and then hooray, 
right? I just want you to see first the example. So let's run the program. And you can see that we have hooray, number is five, right? So if it is equal to five, we have number equals to five. So now let me collapse this. And what I'm going to do is remove this print statement there. And I'm going to print number. So in here, so number. And I'm going to say, if the number is equal to five, what we want to do is to break. So we want to break out of this loop right here. So check this out. If I run it, you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five. And then as soon as the number is equal to five, we break out of the loop. So this is one way that if you don't want to um, finish the execution of any loop, both while and for loops, you can break out of the loop. The other keyword, so let me actually comment this. So let me comment this. And the other keyword is the continue. And in here, what we're going to do is the following. So I only want to print the number here, right? If it's bigger than five. So I'm going to say if the number is less than five, if the number is less than five, and, e and here I want to increment the number. So right. So if the number is less than five, we're going to continue. So what this does is it goes through the loop and it checks, right, is the number less than five? Yes. Therefore, I'm not going to carry on from this point onwards. So I'm not going to print the number and then go back to the beginning. And then two is two less than five. Yes. Continue. So it just goes back and then checks it, right? As soon as number is bigger than five, then it prints the actual number. So if I run it, you can see that we actually get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Which is exactly what we wanted. So these two words, break and continue, you can use them with four loops, right? So it's not just while, but it is with four loops, right? So let me just give you an example. So here, if you have a list, so let's say four, and then n in, and this will be one, two, three, and then four, five, and I'm going to say if and then n is less than five, right? We're going to continue. And then here we're going to print. So basically the exact same thing. We're going to print n. So if I run, you can see that we get the exact same output here, right? So in fact, let me just remove uh, actually comment this while loop here and then run the program. And there we go. So if the number is less than five, we continue. Basically, uh, I need more numbers here, right? So six and then seven. So just like that, run it and you can see it prints from five, six, seven. And I can also say if the number is equal to five, we want to break out of the loop, which means that it will print one, two, three, and four. So if I run it, you can see that we have one, two, three, and four. So this is everything you need to know about the break and continue keywords. In this section, let's learn about Python functions. So a function is a group of statements to perform a specific task. Previously, you saw that we had this keyword right here. So def, and this is the actual way to create functions. So let's say that we want to have a function that greets someone.
And to create a function is as follows. Type def, and you've seen this before. And here, let's give it a name. So we need to name this function. So here, we're going to say greet, and then add parenthesis. And I'm going to explain what this means in a second. And then here, column, and then indentation. So remember, this is actually tab, right? And now inside is any logic that I want this function to perform, right? So in our case, let's simply say that we want to print and then hello, and then how are you just like that, right? So now, what we can do is use this function right here. And the way that we call the function or the way that we invoke the function is simply by saying greet. And oops, and you see that if I say just greet, Python doesn't know anything about this, right? And when you invoke, so when you want to invoke the function, right? You add the parentheses. Now here, I can run the program. And you can see that we have hello, how are you? So most of your code will rely on having functions and then inside of the function, you will have lots of uh, logic, right? And I'm going to show you exactly um, uh, more examples in a second. So this is an introduction on functions. Right, so you know how to create a function. So this is the actual name. And then inside you can have a series of statements, right? And the way you invoke the function is by simply saying greet, so the name of the function, and then parentheses. So now let me teach you about arguments. So with functions, you can have arguments. So in here, let's say that we want this function to take name. So we're going to take a name, right? So here we're going to take a name, and then we're going to say hello, and let's use F. And then here, let's pass the actual name. So now you can see that this function is actually complaining because we need to pass an argument into it. So here, what we can do now, for example, Jamila, and we can have the same function invoke twice, but with a different name. So here, let's simply say Alex. And now if I run the function, you can see that we have two statements. And here it says, hello, Jamila, how are you? Hello, Alex, how are you? So these are the actual arguments that we are passing into the function. And this is the actual parameter. Now you can have more than one. So here, for example, if you want to have name, and then, um, for example, age, and right here, let's have, for example, um, we're going to say, I know your and then age equals age here. And then here, let's remove this. And if we run this, you can see that we have an error and it says that missing one requirement and then argument age. So we need to pass age. So here, uh, 12 and then 22 run and you can see that basically now we have this function that we can reuse again and again and again right so let's say that for example you have you want to have a default value for this parameter right here so h so what you can do is simply say h equals and then 2 minus 1 so now check this out if i run this you can see that this still works, but now I can remove, for example, um, the actual age from Jamila, run it, and you can see that it works. 
and it takes the actual default value. Now we know that no one has an age of minus one. So what we can do is we're going to say if and then age is less than zero, right? We want to do something, right? But what I really want here is to revert this. So I'm going to say not and then age less than zero. So if it's not less than zero, I'm going to print I know your age or you can even reverse, right? You can say if age is bigger or equal to zero, you know, it's really up to you. So now if I run it, you can see that for Jamila, it says hello Jamila, how are you? And then for Alex, it says hello Alex, how are you? And then I know your age 22. So this is how you use parameters and then arguments. So this is arguments. So this is the actual value that you pass into your functions. Let's write a function that prints first whether you are an adult or not. So here, let's say def and then is and then adult. And then here we're going to take age and we're going to say if age and then greater or equal to 16, we're going to print and then adult and then else we're going to print not yet an adult and then just a sad face there, right? And let's add a happy face. So now let's invoke the function. I'm going to say is adult and then pass, let's say 10. If I run this, you can see that we have not yet an adult and then we have a sad face. If I pass, uh, let's say 45, hooray, it's an adult. Now, what I really want is just a function that tells that tells me whether I'm an adult or not, right? And I don't want this print line. So with functions, what we can do is to return a value from it, right? So here we can say, for example, we can say return and then true. Oops, capital T and then true. Otherwise, we're going to return and then false. So now check this out. If I run, we get nothing. And this is because, right? This is because this now has a value which can be true or false. So that means that we can store this into a result variable and we can print now the result. So if I run it, you can see that it is true. And if I put, for example, 10, you can see that now it's false. So with functions, you can return literally anything, right? So this, so this can be, um, you know, a string, or you can return a list, or a number, whatever you want, right? In our case, we're just returning um, this Boolean right here, true or false. Now, because this returns a Boolean value, we can remove all of this and then simply say return. Just like that. And then remove the semicolon. And this is the exact same thing. So now if I run it, you can see it's false. And if I say 80, whoops, you can see that we get true. So this is functions and return statements. So in here, let me just tell you, or actually prove it to you that we can return something, right? So let's say that we want to have a function that takes M or F and then returns male or female. So def convert and then gender. And here we're going to take gender and the default will be uh, a known 
and add the column there. And now I'm going to say if gender dot and then lower. So we want to lowercase the actual uh, input that comes in equals to and then M or actually M or instead let's just uppercase, right? So upper. So if this is the case, we're going to return and then male and then elif gender dot and then upper equals to and then f return and then female and I forgot the actual column there and now I'm going to say else we're going to return gender just like that. So now if I invoke the function, so I'm going to say print because this returns the actual uh, gender. And now I can say convert gender. I'm going to pass F. I'm going to pass M. I'm also going to pass the lowercase version. So there lowercase version for M and then let's pass hello. And actually, let's say that here. So we are missing the actual column. So here, I want to say um, F and then gender and then pass gender is unknown. And now if I run the program, you can see that we have so here, female, female, male, male, and we pass hello, and then we say gender hello is unknown. So this is how you return values from functions. Right, now that you know about how to work with functions, to be honest, we've been using lots of functions throughout this course. So remember when we had uh, lists and sets, we said dot on any list and check this out. You saw pop, sort, count, extend, uh, all of these methods, right? So these are actually built in the language, right? So this is what Python provides you out of the box, which means that you don't have, for example, to implement uh, the reverse method, right? If you want to reverse a list, you don't have to do it because it's already provided the same with strings. So if I have a string and then say dot on it, you can see that we can uppercase, we can lower starts with, we can capitalize, we can center and code find formats and all of these methods. So these methods are actually built into the language to help you and the same with other programming languages, right? So they give you the necessary tools to build programs. So within your methods, you will end up using built in methods. So these are actually built in methods and the ones that we define ourselves. So when we say def, so this is actually our, the ones that we define and with our methods, we can define any logic that we want. So I just wanted to show you that we've been using methods throughout um, this course, but those methods were provided by Python and with Python, we have this important keyword, so import, and you've seen import. So what this allows us to do is to import modules within Python. So here, for example, I can import the math um, module and inside of this math module. So if I say print, for example, I'm going to say math and then check this out dot. And now I do have available methods and values. So here you can see that this is a value. So pi, if I run the program, there we go. So this is the actual value of pi. If I dot and then let's have a look at a different method. So here 
is square root. So let's try and see if 16 is a square root. And this actually gives us the square root of 16. So if I say 25 and the square root of 25 is 5. So 25, oops, can't type today. So 25 and you can see that it is 5. So this is the import statement as well. And you can basically just use modules that are built in within Python or your own modules or external modules that other people have written. And if you want to use their code, you simply import the module and then use it. Now with imports, so there are two ways that you can import. So here you see that is square root. So I can say from and then math import and then is square root. So this is a different way. Instead of bringing the entire module, you can just bring is square root just like that. If I run it, you can see that we get the exact same output. So this is everything about functions and using the import statement to import existing modules that gives you the flexibility of using existing code written by other people or from yourself or code that comes with Python. So in, in our case, we have is square root. Now is the perfect time to teach you about modules. So you saw that we learned about the import statement here, right? And the import statement allows you to import existing code, right? So we can import built in code provided by the Python library, or we can import external modules that contain code that other people have written. And I'm going to show you this later in this course. So in this video, what I want to show you is how to create your own file, which then you can import and use it. So what we're going to do here is the following open up the project tab. So I've just pressed command and then one and inside let's create a new file. And here type cal and then culator dot and then py. Right. So you can create a file like that or you can create a Python file here. There we go. And then put the name and you don't need the actual py there. So now we have this calculator dot py. So in here, what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to have two functions. So let's have a function. So say def and then add. And let me put this a little bit bigger, right? So add and this will take n1 and then n2 and it will return n1 plus n2. Let's have another function. So here. So we're going to have Oops, just like that. Let's have four, right? So here, this will be subtract and then minus and then divide. And then this will be division and then multiply. Right? So what we can do with this calculator.py, and let me just put bigger so you can see what we've done, right? So we've got a function that adds, subtract, and then divide, and then multiply. And I've got a typo there, so multiply just like that, right? So we've got these four functions. Now, what we can do is actually go to main.py and then say import and then calculator. So we are actually importing our own module, right? So the way you saw that we had import and then math, right? So this is provided by Python. So we didn't have to write any of this, but here we are importing our own code. So you, you can share functionality throughout your application by creating reusable code. So now we can say here, so let's say print and we're going to say calculator dot and then 
we've got our functions here. So divide, multiply, subtract, and add. So let's pass two, or oh, actually two, and then two. And let's say add, divide, or oh, actually we already have that. So multiply, and then subtract. And if I put this larger, so you can see, there you go. So now, so now I can run this. And you can see that we have the results right here, right? So two divided by two is one. And then let's actually say two multiplied by four is, is eight. It should be eight, but we have an issue here. So we have six here and then subtract. So two take away two is zero. So let's fix the actual calculator. So here, let's go to calculator.py and then fair enough. So here where we said multiply, this should be a star just like that. If I go back and then run the program again, and now we get the correct answer. So two times four is eight right here. Now the last thing that you saw is we can change this import statement a little bit. So we can say from and then calculator import and then divide. We can also duplicate this, we can say, import add, and then multiply. And then the final one was subtract, right? So the reason why you would do this is, for example, if I only need the divide method, I can remove all of that. And then just have it like this, right? So now I'm not bringing the entire functionality. So all of these methods into this main.py file. So this is how you create modules and import them. If you have any questions, do let me know. Otherwise, let's move on. Right, let's learn about classes. So classes is a concept which is really important that you understand. So what a class is, and literally this is across every single programming language. So what a class is, is a blueprint for creating anything that you can think of. Literally anything in the real world that you can think of, you can represent in code. And what class is, is just a blueprint that allows you to create um, objects, right? So class is the blueprint. And then from the blueprint, you can create objects. So one or many objects, right? So just let's just take this example right here. So again, my pink phone, don't laugh. Uh, so right here. So in order for us to create this phone right here, so this iPhone, right? We have a blueprint and the blueprint is the specification of how this phone is created, right? So, um, you know, this could be in the factory where they have already the template where they can say, right, so now give me, you know, a thousand of these similar phones right here, right? Or uh, you can say, right, so instead of being pink, give me a black phone or a red phone, so on and so forth, right? So with classes, what we do is we specify the attributes. So attributes are uh, anything that um, resembles the phone, right? For example, here, um, the color, for example, the color, right, is an attribute of this phone is pink. The brand is an attribute, Apple. Uh, whether it has touch ID, right? So that's um, another attribute. The price, right? How much does it cost? That's an attribute, right? And then you have behaviors. So attributes and behaviors. So behaviors are what this phone, right? Or what the actual um, object can do, right? So for example, here we can unlock. So this is one behavior, right? So we've just unlocked the phone or we can make a phone call and this is another behavior, right? So with classes, you can literally model anything that you want. And this is uh, the, 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 and this is the world of 
uh, object oriented programming right involves you creating a bunch of classes and then connect them together so i hope you understood what classes are so classes are a blueprint uh, for you to create anything that you want for example um, i've got this lens right here so again i can create a blueprint so a class that tells me how to create many of these lenses right um so you've got classes the blueprint and then you've got the object so the object is the real thing right so it's a real thing if i had a second iphone these these would be two different objects right or for example right here so this is one object and this is another object right so these are two different things and how we create them is by using classes so i hope you understood this example and without further ado, let me go ahead and show you how to create classes with Python. All right, so let's define our blueprint to create as many phones that we want. So let's go ahead and say class. So this is how we create class in Python and we have to give it a name. So we're going to say phone and column here. Now let's define some attributes. Simply say def and then underscore underscore init. And in here, so this init is how you create these phones. So this is the, the actual constructor. So inside, we want to pass the brand and price. And you'll see this in a second, how it works. So now say self dot and then brand equals to brand. And let's say self dot price equals to and then price. So now we have two properties. So brand and price. Let's define one behavior for this phone. So here, let's have a behavior. So here we're going to say call. And we always take self in here. So this refers to the current instance of the current class. Let's say that we want to print for now. And then I'm going to say F and then pass and then say phone calling and let's pass or oh, actually let's go back and then brand or oh, actually self we need to say self and then brand to refer to the current instance is calling and then dot 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 um in fact let's let's just give one more argument here so let's say phone and then number and then here phone and then number so let me just make this a bit smaller so you can see everything so we have and this should be actually just like that so this is the convention you saw that pycharm was yelling at me so now we have this blueprint which allows us to create many phones so let's create the actual phone so this is the instance right for our phone so in fact let me just kill this space here and now to create a phone we can say iphone equals to and then phone and inside we're going to pass the brand and the price so this is iphone and then seven plus so this is my phone and the price we can pass a price so here let's say that this phone is like 300 pounds and there you have it now we have a phone let's create another phone so here this will be for example samsung and then s i think is s20 and then this is like you know 1400 right which is really expensive so now we need to actually um, rename this. So this actually is Samsung. So the name of the variable, just like this. 
and this is the actual iPhone. Let's now print the values. So I want to print uh, iPhone. So I just want you to see something here first. And I'm also going to print Samsung. So in here, right? So this iPhone, this is now the actual object. So remember, a class is just a blueprint for creating objects, right? So it's just a class, it's just a template. And now in here, we are creating the iPhone. So this is the actual thing, the actual physical, not physical, but the real thing, the actual object. And then here we also have the Samsung, right? So we are creating uh, multiple phones from the same template. And this is what a class is. If I run this, you see that we get main and then phone and this is object and then this is the actual uh, address in memory and this is not pleasant right so you know when you print an object you sometimes want to actually get the actual string representation of the object and i'm going to show you this in a second so here we can go and say dot and then brand and we can say dot and then price so let's just let's just do it for iPhone now. If I run it, you can see that we have iPhone 7 Plus and 300. That's the price. We have one behavior, so price. Oh, uh, actually, print, and then iPhone. Or we don't have to print because um, in here it does a print. So here, let's say iPhone dot and then call, and we want to call this phone number. So 999. And then if I run it, you can see iPhone 7 Plus is calling 999. Let me just take all of this and then do a print. And that will be blank. So here, let's change this from iPhone to Samsung. Run. And you can see that. Oops, let's change the name here. The number actually, just any number. Run it. And you can see that we have Samsung S20, 1400 the price, and then Samsung, and I've got a typo on Samsung. So Sam and then Sung, just like that, and run it again, and there you have it. So this is an introduction on classes and objects. So just to recap, a class is just a blueprint, and in here, Oops, let me just kill. So in here, so this method, so def init is this. So this is the actual init. And here you see that we pass the brand and the price. And this is why we pass brand and price in here, right? And then we say self dot brand equals to the brand. So self refers to the current instance of the current class. And if I remove, for example, the init method, you see that I'm, I, I no longer can do this. So I can't do it. So all I have to do now is just remove um, this, right? And now I've got a phone, which tells me nothing. So this is what constructors are. So let me just go back. And then we have one behavior, which simply uh, call, right? So the call behavior, uh, simulates the phone calling a number. And then here we have the actual objects, right? So iPhone and Samsung. So these are the individual objects. So these are two separate things. So this is everything about classes and objects. If you have any questions, please do let me know. Otherwise, let me show you how to print objects properly. Right, so you saw that we tried to print. So in here, let's print and then iPhone. And in fact, let's just move everything, right? So we tried to print iPhone and also Samsung. If I run it, we get this nonsense right here. So object add and then some random numbers. So what we're gonna do instead is inside of our class, we can override the toString method. 
So this works the same with other languages. So here, what I'm going to do is use PyCharm to help me with this. So I'm going to press Control and then Enter, and then Override Methods, or actually you can press Command O. So let's press Command O instead. And you can see that we can override a bunch of methods. So we have equals, we have str, we have format, reduce, dir, and whatnot. Um, so if I type in it, so you see that we have, uh, actually we don't have in it here, but I thought we had in it. So in here, what I want is to override this method right here. So str. So press OK. And now what I'm going to do is remove this. And I'm going to return or oh, actually it's actually returning already. So F and then I'm going to say brand and then self dot brand and then price equals two and then self dot price just like that. And now if I run the program, when we print these two objects, check this out. So now you can see that we have the string representation for our object. So usually you'd have, uh, for example, brand equals to and then a comma, uh, something like that, or even a new line if you wanted. So this is how you add a new line. So if I print, um, basically, I remove that space there. So there you have it. So you can see that we have brand and then iPhone 7, price 300, brand Samsung, and then price 1400. So this is how you override the string method. So obviously, um, you can override any uh, many other methods for different purposes, which I'm going to leave some links that you can read about. But in here, so let me just remove the def uh, init function. And if I press command O, you can see that we have the init. So before we didn't have because we're, we already had the method, but here I can simply just do it like that, right? Um, it's a bit different, but we can just just remove this and then change it the way that we had it. So let me actually put it back just like that. And there you have it. So this is how to override the str method within Python. And one thing that maybe you haven't um, you haven't noticed, or if you have noticed, is this arrow, right? So this arrow right here. So what this arrow means, it simply means that this method returns the string data type in here. So I can even remove this, and this is absolutely fine. But if I want to be more precise, I can say, right, so this method returns an str. Or, for example, if this method was to return an integer, you could say an integer. But here, now you can see that this is complaining because it says expected type int and got str. So let's remove this or you can leave it if you want. And it's really up to you. And this is pretty much everything. Catch me on the next one. With Python, we can work with dates. And it's very straightforward and something that you will end up having to use every now and then if you want to store, for example, dates or date of births or anything which is date related. So to work with dates, we have to import the daytime module. So you saw how to import um, before. So simply type import and then let's say date and then time. So now I can say print and let's say date time dot. And in here we have uh, the ability of, for example, getting the actual date time. So date time gives us an object. So you can see values an object. And in here we can say dot. And then now, if I run this, you can see that this is the current date and time. 
if you only need to grab the actual date, I can duplicate this and then say date instead of date time. And then now run it and we get an error. And this is because date doesn't have um, now method, right? So here and instead it has today. So my bad there, if I run it, you can see that this is today's date. So 2020 September the 27th. If I want if I only need time, I can duplicate this date time. And it's pretty much the same as the other one. So now and then dot and then time. If I run it, you can see that we also get the actual time in here. So this is how you work with dates. Let me now show you that instead of having, for example, date time and then date time, uh, day, day time and then date, let's improve this a little bit. So we're going to say from, right? So we want to um, say from and then date time. We want to import date time and we also want to import date just like that. And now we can drop this day time dot and then um, day time. And then basically we can drop, oops, we can drop this, right? So here we can drop that and we can drop that as well. And we can drop this as well. So this looks much neater. If I run it, you can see that we get this output. So date time here, we get the actual date only and then we can also get the time in here so let me see whether we have the date so here yes we also have the date in here so we could actually get the date like this um but if for example you want to uh, get the year right you can only get the year if you want if you want to get the month and finally if you want to get the actual day you can do it. So if I run it, check this out. So we have date time, the year, month, and then this is the actual day, right? And this is how you work with dates. Next, let me show you how to format dates with Python. Right, so you saw how to work with dates in the previous video. So if I run this, I want to show you something. So here you can see that we have 2020 and then the 9th and then 27th. So sometimes this is not the actual format that we want. So maybe we want the format of this date to be the 27th of September and then 2020. So let's learn how to format our date. I'm going to leave this first print statement here for now so, you, so we can compare things. But the way we format dates is as follows. I'm going to extract this to a variable and I'm going to say now and I'm going to print now. So basically this is the same thing. So if I run it, you can see that we have the actual date as well as the time. But what we can do is say now dot and then str f and then time and here we're going to pass a string. So this is how we want to format things. So here, go ahead and say percent and then D and then space percent and then M space percent and then capital Y. And let's also format the time. So here percent and then hour. So capital hour and then percent M capital M actually, and then percent, oops, percent capital S. So this returns the formatted date. And I can say print on it, just like that. And if I run it, check this out. So now we have things a bit different. So we have now the 27th of September. So we reverse things and then the date and check the time as well. So zero, zero, and then 18, 
and then this is this is the actual seconds so I can do this actually so I can do a fourth slash here if I want fourth slash and then column and then column oops and then column here run it and this is our formatted day if you want for example dash so many systems work with dashes and there you have it another way to format is so let me duplicate this if you want the month right so instead of being a number but you want the actual uh, month you can say b and then run this so here you have September, right? So here, this is the number, but by just saying percent and then uppercase B, we get the name of the month. And if you just want an abbreviation, so let me just duplicate this, just simply say lowercase B and then run and check this out. You have 27th of SEP instead of September. And then you have the, the actual um, time. And this is how we go about formatting uh, dates. So obviously uh, we've done with date time, but you could do it with uh, the actual date. So for the date, let's say date dot today dot and then strf. And let's just grab this here. So it's the exact same thing. So here, and then we can say print and and that. So let me actually put it right at the end. So I'm gonna cut that and then put it here and run it and check this out. It's the exact same thing. If you want uppercase P there for the month, so duplicate and then instead of M, uppercase P run it is the exact same thing. This is how you go about formatting dates. Let's learn how to work with files in Python. So to create a file, it's very straightforward and easy. Simply type F and this is the actual name of the file. So in fact, let's just say file and then open. And then here, can see that we can pass the file and then mode buffering encoding so on so here what we're going to do is the following so we're going to say dot forward slash so in the present directory we want to create a file called data dot c s oh, csv and then next what we need to specify is the actual mode so the mode is whether we want to write to the file, we want to open a file for reading, or we want to append to a file. So if you want to write to a file, you simply say W. So this will create a file if it doesn't exist. If I open up the project tab, so in here, I'm gonna press command and in one, and let's run this. You can see that we have date and it's not date that I wanted it was data. So let's just delete this file. There we go. If I run it again, you can see that we have a data.csv. So now inside this is empty. So for now, let me ignore the extension, but you can see that we've created a file. So how do we open the file? for reading and writing in here let's change this to r and then plus so this is how we open the file for read and write if you just want to read you say r but now i want to open for reading and writing so i can now use the file so here file dot and then write and you can see that we can add um, well, actually, we can uh, write a line or we can write lines. For now, let's go ahead and write a line. And this will be ID, comma, name, and then email. If I now run the program, you can see that 
if I open up the data.csv, check this out. We have ID, name, and email. And one thing that we need to do here is to close the file. So anytime that you work with files and you perform any operations on them, you need to close the file. So file and then dot and then close. This is how you work with files. So in here, let me go ahead and have, for example, ID one name Jamila and then Jamila at gmail.com. Let's have another one. So here, Alex and then Alex and then ID will be two. If I run, go back to data.csv, you can see that we have everything in one line, but really what I want is a new line after each one. So here I'm going to add a forward slash and then N for new line, grab that and put it here and the same here. If I run it, go back to data.csv and you can see that we have our CSV file in here, which is really cool. And you saw that every time that we run this, we pretty much just override the file with the new contents. So if you want to append to the file, you say A, just like that. And now this will append. So if I add, for example, if I duplicate that, I just want to comment this and then say three, and then here, Samir, and then Samir at gmail.com, run it, and check this out. We have appended to the file. But if I remove the A, and then say write, and then plus, and if I uncomment everything, and then run, we've just override the file with new contents. So let me actually just put a note here so you know exactly. So in here we have W for writing and then A for appending and then R for reading and then R plus for reading and then writing. And depending on the flag that you pass in here, is the mode that you will operate on the file. Next, let me show you how to read from our file. Now that we've written some contents to the file, let's read it. So to read, let's use the R flag. So we just want to read the file. And let me just delete all of that. And in fact, let me show you that if we try to write, you can see that we have an error, right? So the flag is actually there to do its job. So we can only read now. So if I remove all of this, and then I can say print and file dot and then read. So this will actually read the entire file. So there you go. So this is the entire file. If you want, so if I comment this, so if you want to, so file dot and then read, so you can read a line. So here you can see that we've read the entire file, but you can also read line by line and to do it is really straightforward. So if I comment that out, you can say for and then line in and then simply say file and here print line. If I run it, you can see that we read line by line. And what reading a line by line gives you the ability to is to take the line and then, you know, if you want to turn the line into an object or do anything with it, you can do it. And if I show you, so let me just comment that out. We can say file dot and then lines. So here read lines, right? And then run this 
uh, this actually gives us nothing but if we print and run it this gives us a list with each line so you can see that this is line one line two and line three and finally line four so there you have it this is how you read from a file next let me show you a syntax which is the preferred way when it comes to writing and reading from files So another way that we can work with files is to use the with syntax. So what the with syntax gives us, it gives us the flexibility of removing this file.close. So we don't have to remember to close the file when we open it. And the syntax is as follows. So let's remove this from here. And the way we work with the with keyword and file is by saying with and then open the actual file. So in here we have data.csv and the mode for now, let's just say R because we just want to read and then as file. So this is the actual name. And now we can perform everything that we want. So here we can just read the file as we did before. Uh, for now, let's just say print and then file dot and then read. We just want to read the entire file, run it. And you can see that we get the exact same output. And the benefit here is that we don't have to say file dot and then close. This is automatically done for us. Now, one thing that I want to show you is if, for example, we say data, so we know that this file doesn't exist. So if I run this, you can see that we have an error, right? So data.csv, no such file or directory. So what we're going to do instead is the following. So we're going to check first if the file exists. And to do that, we need, so if I remove this, we need to import OS path. So I'm going to say import and then OS dot and then path. So with this, we can check whether the file exists or not. So let's say that here we have file and then name equals to and in fact, let's just have file name equals to dot and then data CSV. And what we're going to do is say OS path dot and then file well, actually is file and then pass file name and this returns a boolean. So if so if the file exists, what we're going to do is open here. So let's indent this and let's pass the file name in here file name and there we go else so else we're going to print that file and then file name does not exist and now if we say for example gibberish here we know that this file doesn't exist Let's run it. You can see that we have file and then the file name does not exist. However, if we change this to data.csv and we know that this exists, let's run it. And actually I've said data.csv.csv. So my bad there, run it. And you can see that we have the contents of the file. So this is a better way of you working with files because you want to check whether the file exists or not. So I think we can even remove the dot forward slash there. So let's just try this. And yes, everything works the same. So there you have it. This is how you read, write, and you've you've seen the actual flags if you want to append to a file and using the always path to check whether the file exists before opening the file.
If you have any questions on this section, drop me a message. Otherwise, let's move on. In this section, let's learn how to use Python to fetch data from the internet. So right here, I'm in google.com and I want to show you how to use Python to retrieve this page right here. So let me go back to PyCharm and in here we're going to say from and then URL lib in port. And then if I press control and then space, you can see that we have a couple of options. And the one that I want is request. Now, what we can do is say request dot URL open, and we're going to pass the actual URL. So HTTP and then colon forward slash www.google.com. And there we go. So now we can extract this to a variable. I'm going to press option command V. And now we have the URL open here. So what I'm going to do is actually name this to R for request. Now I can perform a print. So let me print the actual request. And if I run this, you can see that we have an object. So here, this is a response, right? So we got a response back. So with this response, we can say dot, and then get and then code, and invoke the method there, run it. And you can see that we get 200 status code, which means that the request was fine. And we can read the actual data. So to read the data, I'm going to print and then in here, I'm going to say dot and then read and then invoke the function. And if I execute the program, check this out, you can see that we actually have the website. So we've opened up google.com with Python. You can see that this is a long string, uh, which contains some HTML and JavaScript. So there you have it. This is how you can read from the internet using Python. And you can see that this was, you know, in about four lines of code, we can read from the internet, which is really awesome. Next, let me show you how to, to make an API call and work with JSON objects. All right, open up Google and type jokes. So jokes and then API. So in here, go to this very first link. So github.com official joke API. And what we want in here is to get a random joke. So here you can see that we can get 10 random jokes or just one random joke. So I'm going to grab this link right here and open up a new tab and then paste that in. And you can see that we have some data back. So this is a JSON object. If I go back to that URL and grab this one, or oh, actually it's, it's the same, but random 10. So here at the end, simply say random 10. And you can see that now we get an array of objects containing jokes. So let's grab this URL and use Python to fetch these jokes right here. So let me just go back to this one joke first. So I want you to see. So here you can see that we have the ID type setup and then the punchline here. So let's open up PyCharm and in here, let's just modify this a little bit. So let's have the URL in here equals two. And then that's the URL for 10 jokes. And then here, let's pass the URL just like that. Now, if we run the program, 
you can see that we get an error. And the reason why we are getting an error is because of SSL certificate. So what we need to do is just remove the S. So here, instead of HTTPS, simply say HTTP and run. And there you have it. So you can see that we have the actual jokes. So here we have 10 jokes. So, whoops. So here you can see that this is an array and then we have 10 objects inside. So let's take this data and then use Python to load the actual JSON. So I'm going to collapse this. And what we need is to import and then JSON and then JSON. There we go. And now we can say JSON dot loads. Oops, loads just like that. And we're going to grab the read. So here, I'm going to put this into a variable. So JSON, or oh, actually content, or let me simply say data. So data, and then paste that in. And now we want to load the actual data, just like that. So if I now extract this to a variable, I've got the JSON data and let's print JSON data. So JSON data. So I want you to see things step by step. If I run this, you can see that this is our JSON. Have a look. So what we're going to do is the following. So we're going to loop through, right? So we're going to loop through this JSON data and then pull out the setup and the punchline. So let's do the following. So what we're going to do is so remember how to loop through lists. So let's say four and then, and then J for JSON in JSON data. And now we have access to the actual JSON. So this is the individual JSON. So here, we can get the following. So we can get the general. So let's have a variable called general equals to J. And we're going to grab the setup. Oh, actually, so here, setup. So it's not general. So it's setup. My bad. So setup there. And we're going to grab the setup. And here, Let's grab the punchline. So here you can see punchline. So let's just grab the punchline equals to J and then punch line just like that. And let's for now, let's just print to the console. But if you wanted to turn this into an object, you could definitely do it, right? So you could have a class. And in fact, let, let's just do it. So let's just do this. So what we're going to do here is the following. So we're going to create a class. So let's create a class in here. So class, this will be joke, just like this. And remember, we want to have the init. So override methods init. And in here, what we're going to do is say that we want to pass the setup and then punch line just like that self dot and then punch or oh, actually setup equals to and then setup and we want self dot and then punch line whoops just like that equals to and then punch line right and this is our class. So now what we can do is say joke equals to and then joke. And what we're going to do is pass the setup and punchline. And in here, let's have a list. So let's say uh, jokes equals to an empty list for now. And we're going to append. So let's append. Or actually, or actually just say jokes dot and then append and then joke. 
and you can see that we are building a little program here so now we finished and in here this should be uh, within quotes just like that and now let me just say print so we're going to print so let's for now print jokes and then dot len so jokes dot and then len just like that if i run the program you can see that we have 10 in here but now check this out if we loop so let's actually loop through our jokes that we go back so in fact what i'm going to do is override the str so string so we're going to override the string so here press command o and then str there you there you have it and we're going to return so here this will be the setup and then self dot setup and then punchline and then self dot punchline there we have it now i can go back and we can loop so let's loop so four and then joke in and then jokes we're going to print and then joke so let's just have f got and this will be within curly brackets and then close it here and then say jokes now let's run it and check this out so you can see that we have a bunch of jokes so uh, this was the status code 200 this was the json we got 10 jokes and you can see all the jokes so set up do you want to hear my pizza joke punchline never mind it's too cheesy <laughs> i don't know if this was if this is funny to you but yeah so these are like very dry jokes which they actually become funny uh so yeah this is pretty much how you go about using the request so from url lib as well as the json to read json objects so now you know how to perform HTTP requests. All right, let me teach you about the package manager for Python. So pip is the package manager for installing Python packages. Remember I said that with Python, we can import existing code that other people have written. And pip allows us to download those packages and make it available to us. So in here, you can see, so I'm going to leave the link in the description of this video so you can follow along. And you can see that installation guide it should be very straightforward. And basically, when we installed Python, remember that I said you should add Python to the path, right? So when you do that, everything comes bundled up and if you have any issues you can refer to this page how to install pip so once we have that out of the way we can go back to pycharm and in here so this is the example where we downloaded jokes and you'll see where we're heading to with this um, little application but in here go ahead and open up the terminal so in here you can see the terminal and type pip and then three so this is to make sure that we have pip installed so pip3 is because is what comes with python 3.8 so the latest version that we have installed right so in here you can see that we have a bunch of commands so the command that we want is install so install to install packages and then you can uninstall packages and you can also list packages so you, you can see that you know the commands you can even show information about package um 
you can verify so on and so forth and in here you saw that we imported request from url lib now the most popular package for performing HTTP requests is this one right here called requests. So let's install requests and then use it instead of the request that comes with Python. So open up the terminal and in here I'm going to clear the screen so I just press Control L or you can simply type clear, right? So if you want to learn more about how to use the terminal, go ahead and check my course where I teach the terminal and Vim fundamentals. So this is really important for you to be able to use your terminal. So it's, a, it's an essential skill that you should have, right? As a beginner, you should know how to work with the terminal. So here, let's type pip and then three, install, and then requests. So requests, so in here, you can see that this is what we're doing, right? So we are installing requests. So this is the name of the module. If I press enter, you can see that we have a bunch of things and everything was successfully installed. Now that we have requests installed, what we're gonna do is use requests. So let me collapse this and we can say here, import and then requests. So you can see that we have requests here. And with requests, the way that we perform the request is as follows. So let me actually show you in the docs. So you can see here, you say requests and then dot get. So we wanna get from a URL. So let's do that. So in here, what we're gonna do is right here, we're gonna say requests dot and then get and then pass the URL. And what we get back is a response. So now that we have the response, let me show you. So in here, we have the response content and you can see it's simply dot text. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace the data with response dot and then text right here. And I can remove the uh, request with uh, this package right here. So let's delete this import. And then you see that we no longer have to do this. So let's just get rid of that. And let me put it a bit smaller. And you can see that we have an error here. So the way that we do get the actual um, code is by saying response dot and then status code. There you go. And to be honest, this is everything, right? Everything should work as before. And let me just add uh, some spaces here. And in fact, we can even collapse this. So let's take response here. We're gonna cut this and this will go here. We don't need this data anymore. And let me add some spaces here. Now, if I run the program, everything should work as before. So here, if I run the program, you can see that we still have our jokes, right? So remember, status code 200, got 10 jokes. This is the setup. And then we have the punchline here, right? So there you have it. We've learned how to use pip. We installed a module and we are using it, right? So with Python, there are tons of these modules that you can reuse. Next, let me go ahead and show you something really cool that we can do with Python. And that is we're going to take our jokes. So we're going to take our jokes and transform this from text to speech. With Python, there is this library called Py text to speech that allows us to convert text to speech. And it's really, really cool. So the installation process is very simple. So you say pip install and then py 
and then TTS, so Python, text to speech, and then this is like a version. And they give us some usages here. So uh, we can change the voice, we can increase the rate, the volume, so on and so forth. So let me go ahead and show you how to use this. So let's open up PyCharm and let's open terminal and we're going to say pip and then three install and then py text two and then speech so tts so py tts and then x and then three install and then enter just give a second so it's downloading And that's done. So let's now hide this. And to import the module, you say import and then pi text to speech three. So now we have the module here. So what I'm gonna do first is the following. So in here, you see that we have the jokes and then we loop through the jokes here, right? So what I'm going to do is after we loop, so after we loop through the jokes, I'm going to say pi, or actually pi text to speech, dot, and then we can say speak. Now I'm going to pass a text and I'm going to say amigos and then code. So if I run this, amigos code. and you can see that it said amigos code. And you can even change the voice if you wanted to. Now I'm going to take this line and then indent it because what I want to print is the actual joke. So here, instead of amigos code, we're going to say joke dot and then setup and then byte and then TTS X3 dot and then speak and then joke dot and then punchline. So here, let's uh, say, here we want to speak the actual setup. So setup, and let's take this line, and then say, the joke, oh, actually the punchline, right? <laughs> the punchline. And then if I now run this, Setup. What did the great do when he got stepped on? The punk line. He let out a little wine. Setup. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? The punk line. It's okay. He woke up. <laughs> Setup. <laughs> So you can see that it's reading. Which side of the chicken has more feathers? It's reading all 10 the jokes. Line. The outside. And then the next Center. one. There we go. What's Forrest Gump's Facebook password? The punk line. One Forrest one. These jokes are really dry, by the way. <laughs> Let me just stop this. And there you have it. So obviously just threw an error there because I've just stopped it. You can see keyboard interrupted. But this is pretty much how you turn text into speech with Python. This is really, really awesome. And as I said, so in here, you can change the voice if you want. So here you can go and experiment with some other usages. But here, for example, you can change the volume. Here's how to change the voice. So if you want to change the voice to a female, you can do it right here. And you can even save the voice to a file. So you can even so you can imagine that, for example, you might even take a PDF file. You can convert the entire PDF to voice, and then you pretty much don't have to buy audiobooks anymore. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions on what we've done in this section, please do let me know. Otherwise, catch me on the next one.
Assalamu alaikum. I'm super happy that you made this far. So in this course, we've covered the foundations of Python, which means that now you can go and explore different areas, whether you want to learn machine learning, data science, AI, building websites, building RESTful APIs, full stack applications, you can go and explore those areas because now you've got the foundations of Python. So if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe and also give me a thumbs up so I can keep on recording these videos and comment down below, literally comment down below and let me know what you thought about this video. If you're not part of the Amigos Code community, go ahead and join. I would love you to have you there. And this is all for now. I'll catch you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum.